here at the Morgan Hill United Methodist Church as we celebrate the 18th Sunday of Pentecost together. We're so glad that you've chosen to worship with us today on this World Communion Sunday, and we're blessed to have you take part in worship with us today. As we affirm that here Christ welcomes all, and all are welcome. And may the love of God and the grace of Christ, the friendship, the peace of the Holy Spirit be with you this day. At Morgan Hill United Methodist Church, our vision as a faith community is to create an inclusive, reconciling, a progressive spiritual community that welcomes all people based on the teaching of Jesus to love one another. Here, human diversity matters. Here, open minds matter. Here, prayerful hearts that are guided by spirit, rooted in scripture, tradition, reason, and human experience matters. And here, God does not discriminate. And to help you follow our worship service today, you can click on the closed caption at the bottom of your screen, and the words will appear to help you follow the worship service today. Now let us join our hearts and spirits together in this time of worship as our lay servant minister, Trish Catalano, comes to lead us in our call to worship. Thank you, Trish. Thank you, Patrick. On this World Communion Sunday, we say to the Lord, Gather us in, creator of the universe. Gather the lost and the lonely, the broken and the breaking, the tired and the aching who long for nourishment at your feast. Gather us in, redeeming Christ. Gather the done and the doubting, the wishing and wondering, the puzzled and pondering, who long for the company found at your feet. Gather us in, unifying and universal Holy Spirit, and gather the proud and the pretentious, the sure and the superior, and the never inferior, who long for the leveling found at your feast. Gather us in, Holy Trinity, and gather the bright and the bustling, the stirs and the shakers, the kind laughter makers, who long for deeper joys found at your feast. Gather us in, all saints and angels, from the corner or the limelight, from mansion or campsite, from fears and obsession, from tears and depression, from untold excesses, from the treasured successes, to meet, eat, to be given a seat, to be joined to the vine, be offered new wine, and become like the least, be found at the feast. Come all, come now, and gather us in as one family of God. Please pray with me. As we gather at your table from all over the world of God, we pray that all those who come to you in the name of Christ might be one in the Spirit, meet us together in one love, free us from jealousy and selfish ambition, unite us in mission and service to those in need everywhere. May we sow righteousness and harvest peace. Through the grace of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Please sing along as the words appear on your screen to this beautiful and familiar gospel hymn, I Come With Joy. Matthew 
chapter 21, verses 33 to 46. The parable of the wicked tenants is rooted in the economic life of Galilee. Landowners were often absentee foreigners, and they were resented by the local peasantry who were the tenants that worked the land. The estate of such a foreigner was regarded as ownerless if he had died without an heir, and in that case, the tenants would have the first claim upon the property. Thus, in the parable, when the son arrives, the tenants assume that the father has died, and to claim the vineyard for themselves, they would have to kill the son. Matthew strengthens allegorical references in the parable by symbolizing the slaves that he sends as the prophets of Israel, and the landowner in Matthew's story represents God. Matthew condemns the tenants, who symbolize the leaders of Israel, as having abused their trust. Since the leaders of Israel had not rendered in its fruit the right living to God in due season, the kingdom will be given to another group of people, to a Gentile people. So I invite you to hear this parable from the New Testament interpretation entitled, The Message. Then Jesus said, Hear another parable. There was a master of a house who planted a vineyard, and put a fence around it, and dug it dug a wine press in it, and built a tower, and leased it to tenants, and went into another country. When the season for fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the tenants to get his fruit. And the tenants took his servants, and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. So again he sent other servants, more than the first, and they did the same thing. Finally he sent his son to them, saying, they will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, Oh, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and have his inheritance. And they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. When therefore the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? And they said to him, Well, he'll put those wretches into a miserable death and rent out the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the fruit for the seasons. Jesus answered to them, Have you never read the scriptures? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing its fruits. And the one who falls on the stone will be broken to pieces, and when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they perceived that he was speaking about them, and although they were seeking to arrest him, they feared the crowds, because they held him to be a prophet. This is the Gospel of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Trish. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is the one true church whose faith we support with our prayers, our presence, our giving, our tithes, and our service. So I want to thank uh, a lot of you uh, who have been leaving some dry, good grocery items on your front porch for us to pick up by our Church to Go Back teams at your home each Saturday. And we are very happy to pick up those grocery bags of dry goods and deliver it to our community uh, food bank here in Morgan Hill. Also, thank you to those of you who have ordered your online course entitled Implicit Bias, What We Don't Think We Think. Uh, it's not too late to, to order that. If you'd still like to do that, go ahead and, and get it. But we've got a good group of people now that are, are ready to begin a, a discussion of that. So go ahead, begin the course, those of you that have already purchased it. And remember, it's designed for you to take it at your own pace, to learn about, think through, and practice transforming actions regarding implicit bias in our culture. And I'll be sending out a Zoom invitation very soon for us to share a discussion with Father uh, Bonacci, who uh, many of you know, who is Executive Director for the uh, Peace uh, Project, the Interfaith Peace Project. Also today you will find in your church to go bags uh, that will be delivered to you, uh, that were delivered to you yesterday, an envelope for you to make a donation to our 
World Communion Sunday. And remember, World Communion Sunday it started in 1940 as a Presbyterian-led initiative of the Federal Council of Churches toward an ecumenical celebration of communion by uh, especially um, uh, helping uh, just uh, it's just kind of started with Presbyterians and Methodists and Congregationalists, what we know as the UCC Church, and some Baptist groups at that time. These, in turn, promoted the idea across their missionary networks outside of the United States so there would be more of a, of, of a feel of a worldwide communion on that day. Uh, it is through these ways of connectional learning and, and giving that the people of the United Methodist Church make a huge difference in our communities. So I invite you to give generously as we worship God through sharing our gifts, our tithes, our prayers for one another, our presence, even online, our witness, and our service. Although we cannot put our gifts in the offering plate on Sunday morning, we can visit our giving page on this website and see the opportunities to give directly online or by using our mobile devices, or through our bank's online bill payment system, and always by mail. Remember, our gifts come from us as the people of God, for the work of God, to the glory of God in the world. Amen. So please pray with me now. Most gracious God, you hold each person's life as a more precious than we can imagine. When we turn aside from following your way, you urgently call us back to your way. Send your Spirit to give us a new heart to live as faithful people who show forgiveness to others, and we dedicate our lives and our money to help share your good news with our neighbors. This we pray through Christ, who poured out his life in love for the world. Amen. I invite you now to listen as Denise Melroy, our church pianist, provides a wonderful offertory uh, entitled how firm a foundation.
nothing can separate us from the love of God shown to us in Jesus Christ. Please keep in your prayers for peace, comfort, strength, and healing, those struggling with life-threatening illnesses, as well as those who have recently lost loved ones and are struggling with their own grief and sadness as a family. Please remember in your prayers for strength and healing, we keep in our prayers Laura, Linda, Gemma, Chris, Alec, Kat, Bridget, Ellen, Cricket, Mitzi, Jalen, and Dan. And for peace and comfort, we keep in our prayers the Lockwood family, the Smith family, and the Coleman family. For hope, we keep in our prayers May Lee and others who are looking for work in their fields, and for those who were furloughed on October 1st. Also, keep in your prayers the concerns of the world as we pray for the, it's hard to believe this number, the one million plus families who have also lost loved ones worldwide from the COVID-19 virus and for people everywhere who are still struggling with this infection. We pray for those who are caught in these times of violence and for the safety of peaceful protests, especially in Louisville, Portland, Minneapolis, New York, Los Angeles, Miami, Nashville, Salt Lake City, Cleveland, and Raleigh. We pray for those who are affected by the glass fire and for the firefighters battling the latest wildfire in California and for those who are being evacuated, are evacuated, those who no longer have a home or business to go home to. We pray for the safety of our police and our firefighters, school teachers, and for the safety of our children. We pray for those who work in our grocery stores and our first responders, doctors, nurses, and all medical personnel who are continuing to live in the midst of this pandemic. Please continue to email your prayer concerns to us here at the church office so that Pastor Patrick and our prayer team can keep your concerns and their prayers this week. For the prayers shared and those that remain in the silent places of our heart, we say to the Lord, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Please pray with me. Gracious God, we come together as Christians from all over the world to share in the bounty of your table. We gather to share the cup of life and the bread that provides strength for our journey. We gather speaking many languages and worshiping you in unique ways to our culture and heritage. But in our diversity, there is unity. Nowhere else, loving God, are we made more aware of how interconnected we are, really are than at your table. The bread and the cup, symbol of Christ's broken body, speak to us of the broken bodies in the world today, which cry out for the healing power of your spirit. And so we humbly offer to you our lives and our spirits, just as we are, knowing that you can use our brokenness to bring about healing and wholeness in your name. On this Worldwide Communion Sunday, we lift our prayers to you, knowing that you have already hear the yearnings of our hearts. We lift the prayers of our global neighbors, especially those persons living in fear of, or poverty, and for those who have lost hope. Give us the courage to recognize and name the pain of our global neighbors and to reach out where we can. In your mercy, Lord, hear our prayers. We lift prayers for our earth that we all share and that you have entrusted to us to nurture and care for. Enable us to use our power wisely as our earth is reaching the point of being unable to feed its people and because land is being destroyed by greed and careless development and erosion. In your mercy, Lord, hear our prayers. We lift prayers for those close to us, some of whom we name in our hearts, the sick, the addicted, the abused, the imprisoned, the depressed, and those grieving some loss in their life. May they be comforted and fed by the bread and cup of new life. In your mercy, Lord, hear our prayers. We lift prayers for ourselves and for our society that put so much worth on material wealth and possessions. 
Free us so that we can learn to receive and give with equal joy. In your mercy, Lord, hear our prayers. Pour out your Spirit upon all the nations of the earth and upon all whom you have named and claimed as your own in Christ's name. For all the blessing in our lives and for your promise to always be with us, we lift our prayers of praise and thanksgiving. And this we pray in the way that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you, Trish, for that beautiful World Communion prayer that you shared with us. I'd like to talk about pressing on over the next few Sundays. It seems to be our normal mode these days. We are overwhelmed with changes, overrun with failures, overruled by objections, and we've just witnessed a presidential debate that was both horrific and disturbing, to say the least. It seems as though every step is an uphill climb, and yet we press on. There is a kingdom to build, K-I-N, kingdom. And what we do as individuals and as a church community, it does matter. It is exhausting for all of us, which is why pressing on is a multi dimensional task that we all have to participate in. Yes, there are tasks to perform. Yes, there is the doing involved that we've got to do, but the doing grows out of our being in the body of Christ. We must pay attention to who we are, even as we engage in what we do. This sermon series during the month of October is going to invite us to the task of pressing on. And that's the theme that, will we, that we will be working with over the next four weeks. It's a, it's a phrase we may relate to the Apostle Paul in our companion scripture to the Gospel of Matthew's reading today, where we have the Apostle Paul in his letter to the Philippians saying in chapter 3 and in verse 12 following, Not that I have already obtained or reached the goal. Rather, I press up to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Beloved, this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. Now Paul is saying in that wonderful chapter, chapter 3 in Philippians, that he is setting everything aside that gives him credentials and authority and material status. He is setting all that aside to, to follow the divine call of God in his life and follow in the way of the risen Christ. Like Paul, we have too many things to, to think about these days, too many things distracting us, too many things that overwhelm us, to say the least, and many of us seem overwhelmed. Just count the things that we're currently dealing with. A pandemic with overwhelming death worldwide, a political system, that Tuesday's presidential debate is a shameful disgrace and a horrific show of disgust. Economic loss and unemployment, racism and injustice that is tearing this country apart. It just might be time for a reset. The Reverend Junius Dotson, who is the 
General Secretary of Discipleship Ministries for the United Methodist Church. And he's written a book, and he's entitled it Soul Reset, a book about finding space to breathe, about reorienting our life with gospel priorities. And Paul writes in the fourth chapter of Philippians about reorienting the mind. Paul says, finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. So we need to consider again what it is that is worth resetting our minds upon, what is worthy of occupying our minds. Our world is full of all kinds of demands on our, on our mental space, much of which is not really for our benefit or a way to enhance our faith or our discipleship. Rather, this is a perfect time to take some time and spend some time on the words of the songs that, that we offer in worship. Even pay attention to the prayers that are provided in today's uh, lit litany. Let the meanings begin to sink in a little bit. Listen to the images of God and of the church that are presented in the litany and the music and in the words and in the prayers. Take the prayers apart. Look at the components. Consider what is actually being prayed. And as you recite the Lord's Prayer, for example, what are these petitions about? Why are the requests put in this order? What is the true hope of the prayer? How radical is this thing that, that we've said so many times before that we aren't really listening to anymore? And then think on these things. Think on what it is that we, the people of God, need to be pressing on toward. What is the prize? What is the goal that Paul is calling us toward? That's something new, something true and honorable and just that Paul is talking about in his letter to the Philippians. I mentioned earlier some current pertinent issues and how I invited all of us to fill our minds with the honorable response, not just those knee-jerk responses that polarize our country and create political divisions, but rather engage honorable and healing conversations that will bring the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ together with the wisdom of the community. Remember, we're pressing on and upward toward the kingdom of God. K-I-N, the kingdom of God. And when I use the term kingdom, K-I-N, I use it to replace the pervasively male-oriented imperialistic word kingdom, where you have a king over things. And some theologians feel that kingdom, K-I-N, more fittingly reflects the kind of world that Christ envisions. It refers to the family or the relational aspect of God's recreation of the world, even as it recognizes the authority of God as Jesus taught it. Obviously, the roots of masculine language in Scripture is derived from the political atmosphere of ancient empires. But feminist and women's theological studies have shown us a more inclusive, cooperative way of understanding the vision of God for all creation. And whatever word or metaphor you use to describe the vision of God for all creation, the undeniable fact is that while we aren't there yet, yet still we're pressing on as if it were. We are called to build the kingdom, starting with our own community, 
our own lives as we press on to where God has called us and is continuing to call us. This week, we acknowledge that this pressing on won't happen without changing our minds, without thinking on these things. And in Matthew's Gospel that, that Trish shared with us today, Jesus tells this parable of, this, of these wicked tenants after he had entered Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, went into the temple and threw the money changers out of the temple, silenced the religious leaders of his day in the temple when they questioned his authority, and told another parable implying that tax collectors, thieves, and prostitutes would be first to enter God's kingdom ahead of the established religion, religious leaders. Oh my, how horrible and terrible and awful would that be? Yet Jesus undoubtedly had in mind another parable that had been told by the prophet Isaiah that involved a vineyard that God had carefully protected and tended and planted with choice vines. God hoped for a good crop of grapes, but the vineyard yielded only wild grapes. So God tore down its wall and let his vineyard be destroyed. The prophet Isaiah didn't leave his listeners uh, to, to guess the, uh, the point of this parable, but immediately he explained it to them. The vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of God. And the people of God are God's choicest and finest vines that have been planted. And God expected justice, but saw only injustice. God expected righteousness, but the people weren't living as God had called them to live. Jesus begins his parable, much as the prophet Isaiah had done. And Jesus' listeners and hearers that day knowledgeable in the scriptures, would have quickly seen the connection to the prophet Isaiah. A landowner, like the beloved in Isaiah's story, has a vineyard. He builds a protective wall and other necessary structures, then rents it to tenants who are expected to do the necessary work there, and then he leaves for another country. When harvest time comes, the owner sends people to collect the produce, which is rightfully his, because he is the owner of the vineyard. But the tenants act as though they own the whole vineyard. They beat up and kill the true owner's representatives. The owner sends more representatives who are treated the same way. And finally, the owner sends his son. Surely they'll respect him, he thinks. But instead, they threw him out of the vineyard, and they killed him. When Jesus asked his hearers what the owner will do, their answer is a natural one. He'll kill the wicked tenants and call new ones who will recognize his ownership and give him the fruits the vineyards provide. But Jesus doesn't respond to that answer as such. Rather, he translates it into a real-world situation. God, the vineyard owner, will get rid of the wicked tenants, meaning the present religious leaders' authorities, and give the status of his, of, of his people to those who recognize his lordship and to those who understand their basic task as the church to proclaim Christ and press on toward the goal of, that God is calling the church to, even in the midst of so much overwhelming situations, and to sustain its members and to bear witness to what Christ did and is continuing to do in the world. And when that is done, faithfully, God's vineyard will produce the fruits of the Spirit that Paul listed. Love joy and peace, patience, kindness, generosity, fruitfulness, gentleness, and self-control. 
Amen. So be it. Please pray with me. Blessed are you, Lord God of the universe. Through your goodness we have this bread to offer, which earth has given and human hands have made. Let it be for us the bread of life. And we thank you for this wine, fruit of the vine, and work of human hands. Let it be for us our spiritual drink to nourish us and how to love and serve as the body of Christ on earth, we pray. I invite all of you who have gathered to share this time of Holy Communion in the sacred place of your home as you connect with the sacred place of this sanctuary. And to all who are hungry, come and feast on the bread of life. To all who are angry, come to the table of grace. To all who feel lonely and empty, Come, taste, and experience the fellowship of the body of Christ. To all who are spiritually and emotionally tired, come, rest in the grace of Christ and the love of God. May the Lord be with you as we lift up our hearts to the Lord and give our thanks and praise to the Lord our God. Let us pray. It is a right and good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Almighty God. It is with your people on earth and all the company of heaven that we praise your name and join their unending hymn as we share the great song of the prophet Isaiah. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the heights. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Let us continue in prayer, saying, Holy are you and blessed is Jesus, who reveals your love and compassion in the world. In the fullness of time you sent Jesus to manifest and make known your presence in the world. And so it is that we remember that on the night before he was crucified, he took some bread and he gave thanks to you, Almighty God. And then he broke the bread and he shared it with his disciples. And he said, take and eat. This is my body that is given for you. Do this and remember me. And likewise that evening, when the supper had ended, he took the cup and he shared it with his disciples, saying, Drink from this, all of you. This is my life, being poured out for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this, and as often as you drink it, remember me. Sisters and, and brothers, whenever we receive this bread and share this cup, we are remembering not only Jesus' life and death and what he taught us, but also how he taught us to love one another and to live in the reality of the risen Christ that is present among us. And when we share in this meal, let us also remember we are sharing in God's distributive justice and compassion until God's justice and compassion are fully accomplished on earth as it is in heaven. Therefore, in remembrance of these, your gracious acts in Jesus, we offer ourselves as a living and a holy sacrifice and communion with your great love as we proclaim a joyful voice the mystery of our faith. Dying, you destroyed our death. Rising, you restored our life. Lord Jesus, come in your glory. So pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here, 
and all these gifts of bread and wine. As we receive these gifts of bread and wine, use this meal to nourish us, that we may be the body of Christ in the world. By your Holy Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all people. Amen and amen. In the United Methodist Church, we practice an open communion, which means that all are welcomed to the table of our Lord. It is our tradition to receive communion by the practice of intention, which is a practice whereby we take a piece of the bread, dip it into the cup, and receive it. I invite you now, watching from your home, to take the bread and dip it into the cup and receive the gifts of God for the people of God. Amen. Trish, the bread of life given for you. And the cup of God's love poured out for you. Matthew, the bread of life given for you. And the cup of God's love poured out for you. Amen. Amen. And the wine of compassion. Amen. Please pray with me. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit, and give ourselves for others with the same love as Jesus gave himself and love for us. This we pray. Amen. It's time to celebrate. In Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 1, it says, For everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven. Well, it's time. I would like to wish our Betty a very happy birthday. Her birthday was on September 29th. And also would like to wish Alice a happy birthday today, October the 4th. Happy birthday, ladies. If you have a celebration that you would like a shout out for, please email the office at office at mhumc.com. And if we get them by Tuesday, they'll be included with that week's service. Otherwise, they will be held to the following week. Our closing hymn is, And Are We Yet Alive? So please sing along to the words as they appear on your screen. So go now in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen and amen. <laughs>